My name is Gil McGowan, President of the Alberta Federation of Labour. We're here to talk about uh, Jason Kenney's new budget, tabled just last week on Thursday, uh, less than a week ago. And we're going to talk about that budget from a Labour perspective. Uh, as is our practice at the Federation of Labour, we begin all of our meetings uh, with a land acknowledgement. So we're going to do that first. And then I will proceed to introduce our panel uh, and make a few opening comments. But once again, before we do that, our land acknowledgement. Um, so um, uh, the Alberta Federation of Labour respectfully acknowledges that we are uh, meeting on uh, Treaty 6 territory in central Alberta and, uh, and uh, Treaty 7 territory in southern Alberta. Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Saltu, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories and languages and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. Uh, in the South, uh, this is the traditional territories of the Blackfoot na Nation, Siksika, Pekainai, Kainai, Tutsina, the Stony Nakota First Nations, including Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations, as well as the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. The Alberta Federation of Labour recognizes that we are all treaty people with treaty obligations, and we are committed to continue living in accordance with the spirit of an, an intent of peace and friendship that is foundational to the treaty relationship. As a labour movement, we will actively work together in solidarity to end oppression and seek justice for all peoples of this land. So once again, uh, my name is Gil McGowan. I'm president of the Alberta Federation of Labour. We're here tonight to talk about uh, the uh, recently introduced UCP budget from a labor perspective. Joining me tonight on our panel, we have um, a number of uh, fabulous guests. Uh, we have Mel McMillan, who is a professor emeritus in the Department uh, of uh, Economics from the University of Alberta, former Dean of the Department of Economics at the, the U of A. Uh, and he's also a fellow at the Institute for Public Economics. Welcome, Mel. Uh, we are also, uh, uh, joined today by a number of uh, prominent uh, labor leaders from Alberta. The, these names you will recognize. Uh, we've got uh, Quinn Benders, who's a vice president of the Non-Academic Staff Association at the University of Alberta. We've got Ricardo Acuna, president of the Association of Academic Staff at the University of Alberta and the treasurer for the Confederation of Alberta Faculty Associations. Uh, we have Heather Smith, who is the president of the United Nurses of Alberta. We've got Guy Smith, president of the, the Alberta Union of Provincial Employees. And finally, rounding out our panel, we have Rory Gill, who is the president of the Alberta Division of the Canadian Union of Public Employees. Uh, before we turn to the panel, I'm just going to make a few remarks uh, to frame our discussion. Uh, because we're at a perilous time. Um, you know, it's often said that government budgets are roadmaps. And if that's true, this budget is a map to nowhere, or even worse, it's a map that might take us off the cliff if we follow the, 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 follow the map. Uh, when introducing the budget last week, Jason Kenney uh, and his finance minister, Travis Taves, they said that this budget was all about creating jobs and preparing for the post-COVID recovery. Uh, but it does neither of those things. In fact, it kills jobs. Uh, another 1,500 jobs uh, are going to be eliminated in the post-secondary sector. Uh, that's after, this is basically the third year of massive cuts uh, to your, our universities and colleges. At the same time, uh, the government uh, has made it clear that they still intend to eliminate 11,000 jobs in healthcare once the pandemic passes. And uh, you know, so, so this budget does nothing for jobs. It also does nothing to pave the way for a recovery. There's no new money, there's no new programs. And even uh, those areas that more and more people agree that need to be acted upon in order to ensure um, a recovery like investing in universal childcare, nowhere to be seen in this budget. Um, in response uh, uh, to their plummeting popularity, uh, and we, we've seen the polls, Jason Kenney is now our country's most unpopular premier. And in response to that fact, uh, the only thing that we've seen, seen changed in this government uh, is their language. Uh, up until recently, the premier talked about this budget being uh, a fiscal reckoning. Uh, but instead of that um, uh, hard language where they've softened their tone and they're talking about things like lives and livelihoods. Uh, but 
you know, tonight we want to encourage people not to be, uh, you know, taken in by this change in language, make no mistake. Uh, this is still an austerity budget. Um, if you look at, if you take away the, 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 the federal money that's coming uh, to deal with COVID, um, this budget actually spends about 400 to 500,000, $500 million less uh, than when the UCP took office um, uh, two years ago. Um, as I mentioned, uh, post-secondary education is particularly hard hit. Um, they've been cut by hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and, and just today, just hours ago, uh, we heard the premier saying that uh, after this year, after COVID, um, that, that he does intend to, to cut uh, as much as seven or eight billion dollars from subsequent budgets. Uh, so seven or eight billion dollars less that he's spending today. So um, they are still wedded to these ideas of austerity. Uh, the budget also needs to be seen uh, for what it is. It's political retrenchment. It's a strategic retreat, not a change of heart. Uh, this is a government that is still committed to their ideological project of shrinking the public sector through cuts and privatization. Uh, the only things that's changed um, is their spin, uh, their language and their timetable. Um, you know, it, you know, I think it was clear that they were planning to uh, hit the public sector and public sector workers with the double whammy. There were going to be cuts uh, to services, and then there were going to be cuts to wages. Uh, what this budget shows is that for this year, instead of doing both at the same time, uh, they're going to focus on cutting wages. Uh, when it comes to wages, the budget is built around an assumption uh, that wages for all public sector workers in this province will be cut by at least 5% this year. Uh, to be followed by uh, an indefinite uh, series of zeros in years to come. Uh, what this represents is a significant and permanent um, uh, reduction, not only in the wages, but of the standard of living of a huge swath of the Alberta population, those people who work in healthcare, education, all the public services. Uh, obviously, this is bad news for the workers involved, uh, but when you withdraw that amount of money from an economy. It also ripples across the economy uh, by reducing consumer spending and consumer demand, uh, which is also bad for the economy. Um, so we're talking about wage cuts, we're talking about service cuts, uh, and these, these will uh, have the, the effect of, uh, of, of hurting the economy, hurting individuals, hurting families. So, you know, this is a UCP budget, despite the spin, the softer tone, uh, and it's also Jason Kenney's budget, but it does share one thing in common with all previous Alberta uh, uh, government budgets, and frankly, including uh, the budgets in introduced by the previous New Democrat government. And that's, uh, th that's the fact that it ignores uh, what is Alberta's real problem, which is a broken revenue system. We simply don't uh, collect enough revenue to pay for even middle of the road services uh, that we need to uh, continue prospering as a province. The, the gap between what we collect uh, from corporate taxes, individual taxes, uh, and what we spend has been filled for years by windfall uh, revenue from oil and gas. That has dried up, it's not coming back, uh, but this government doesn't deal with that fundamental uh, uh, fiscal problem of a broken revenue system. Other big deficiencies, there are many, and we'll talk about them tonight, uh, but I just wanna highlight a couple. The first is that it ignores uh, the total failure of the, the UCP's signature policies that were supposed to create jobs, uh, like the $4.7 billion tax giveaway to profitable corporations that was supposed to create jobs but created none, uh, like the $1.5 billion gamble on uh, the, the Keystone XL pipeline that was supposed to get us a pipeline but left us empty handed uh, with nothing but you know, bigger deficits and lost opportunities. Imagine. Uh, what we could have paid for if that $1.5 billion had been spent on education, healthcare, almost anywhere else. Uh, the other uh, big failure, uh, and perhaps this is the biggest failure of the budget, it, it is that it provides no plan for what comes next. Um, you know, we have an e uh, economy that has been badly hurt by the COVID crisis. Uh, we are facing a world that's moving away from uh, fossil fuels, the things that we sell. Um, we're in the midst of an energy transition, but despite uh, the, uh, the need to rebuild after COVID, the, 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 despite the need uh, to 
you know, address the, the energy transfor transformation that's transforming our economy, uh, this budget uh, says nothing. Um, our province is at a crossroads. We are uh, in desperate need of a vision, leadership, and frankly, courage. Uh, but uh, we get nothing from this government and we get nothing from this budget. Uh, so that sort of sets the table for the discussion that we're going to have today. Um, you know, the bottom line is that uh, we needed a budget uh, that had a big vision um, and we haven't got that and uh, we're all going to pay the price for that. So in order for us to uh, dive into this discussion, we're going to start uh, with a presentation from uh, our friend, Professor Matt Mel McMillan, uh, former Dean of the Department of Economics at the U of A. He's retired now. Uh, he's been retired for a number of years, but uh, in some ways I think you're busier than ever. And you've certainly been given a big task to uh, deconstruct and understand this budget. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you, uh, Mel, to tell us what you think about this budget and what do you think it means uh, for the people of our province. Over to you, Mel. Okay, Gil, uh, you've asked me to uh... You asked me to provide a high level overview and uh, I think you've done pretty well at that already, but let me <laughs> say a few words. Uh, first of all, I think the, ma the main point that I would make uh, and is that despite the dramatic impacts of COVID on the, uh, uh, on the provincial government's finances, uh, it has only proven to be a, what I call a modest and an inconvenient speed bump on the uh, UCP's agenda of cost cutting. Now, they planned initially to um, balance the budget in 22-23. That is going to be delayed. It's going to be delayed a year, two years, maybe even three years. That is hard to say. Much of this still depends upon natural resource revenues. Um, the, the strategy here, of course, is to hold total expenditures constant and uh, rely upon population growth, inflation, and also the growing uh, debt servicing costs to uh, erode the level of public services and the level of expenditures on those public services. The, uh, uh, those factors uh, add up to about 3% a year reduction in real expenditures. And so if you have three years, you're basically talking 10%. If you have five years, you're talking 15%. Trevor Toom, uh, my colleague from Calgary, uh, is telling us that we should be looking at about 14.5% 14, 14 real reduction per, in per capita level of services or expenditures. Uh, the strategy, I suppose, maybe is that uh, uh, if you do it gradually, uh, there'll be less squawking, or maybe there'll be more squawking over a longer, less squawking, but over a longer period. And of course, the longer you delay, just as we've done in the past, is the greater the opportunity for natural resource revenue to recover and bail, bail us out. Uh, I'd like to point out that Alberta is not the big spender that, uh, that it is widely claimed to be. In fact, if you look at the uh, total spending per capita in Alberta for any length of time since 2000, you are basically looking at Alberta spending uh, an amount equal to what the other nine provinces spend. And uh, our uh, program spending is a little bit higher. It's about uh, this year, it's about five to 6% higher than what uh, the, uh, the, the nine province averages. So our spending is not dramatically different. What they do is to look very selectively or make a very selective comparison by looking at uh, only or choosing to look at what they call the comparator provinces, which are BC, Ontario, and Quebec. And they particularly focus on BC and Ontario which happen to be the two lowest per capita spending provinces in the country. Uh, those, uh, uh, and there's no consideration in this 
that Alberta faces somewhat different circumstances. Uh, the uh, uh, fact that uh, in Alberta, if household incomes and wages and salaries are higher than in all the other provinces and have been for many, many years. Uh, and even this December, average weekly earnings in Alberta were the highest of all of those in all the provinces. Now, we must note on that that, uh, that BC and Ontario are catching up and BC particularly is catching up quite quickly. But that means higher costs as well as, uh, as, uh, as, as higher demand as incomes influence demand for public services. Uh, and I ask basically here, why are we not looking at all provinces when, and I think particularly of Saskatchewan, which has had similar experiences with resource booms and busts and uh, similar, similar geography. Uh, interesting thing, uh, Professor or uh, Minister Taves presented in the last, uh, sorry, in a, in a presentation to the uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, a graph showing that Alberta was going to, expenditures per capita were going to equal those of the comparator provinces uh, in 2020. 2023-24, I have no idea how they get to that number. <laughs> I don't know whether it's uh, some imaginary wish on their part. I would like to think it's leading to a concession, but I'm not that confident. Uh, I could say a word or two about debt. I will restrict that and simply say that Alberta's debt is still, despite the rapid increases that we've seen, <laughs> Excuse me. The rapid increases that we've seen is still comparatively low. Alberta, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and uh, British Columbia have the lowest debt, whether you me measure it relative to GDP or on a per capita basis of the other pro of any of the provinces, and considerably below those. Uh, if we're not going to uh, cut services in substantial amounts, we don't, we don't want to do that. And we don't want to be increasing debt extensively. Uh, we have to look at the revenue side of the budget. And there, we might note that Alberta did increase taxes this year by uh, choosing to uh, de-index the uh, personal e exemption. Uh, so that there's going to be some small increase in taxes for Alberta taxpayers personal income taxpayers. But the, uh, uh, we must remember that Alberta is the lowest taxpayer province in the uh, uh, lowest tax of any of the provinces. And that is by far, uh, if we tax in the same uh, way that uh, had imposed the same tax system that Saskatchewan or Ontario do, which are the lowest tax provinces in, in Canada next to us, the, uh, the uh, we would generate uh, $13.3 billion. Now $13.3 billion is far more than is needed to meet uh, any deficit post COVID. And uh, we can expect with modest expenditure reductions that uh, some increase in taxes would generate sufficient revenue to avoid dramatic reductions in cotton services for Albertans. Uh, we can look at a variety. I will just mention the carbon tax, which Albertans are already paying to the federal government. There's the corporate income tax, which doesn't raise, wouldn't raise a lot of money, but provides a substantial subsidy for every job or, for, or subsidy or foregone revenue for every job that it is expected to create. There's a sales tax, which uh, generates revenue in a very substantial fashion. And it's clearly the missing tax from uh, the Alberta tax system. And if that was to be introduced, I would say it should be introduced with some adjustment to the lowest uh, personal income tax or a reduction in the uh, lowest personal income tax uh, bracket. So, uh, 
Trevor Toome says that we are looking at a $10 billion structural deficit, even when all of this is over, and, uh, and it's going to be a long-term deficit. So I fail to see that we're going to be able to get away without having to address on the revenue side, as well as the expenditure side. So let me stop there and uh, turn it over to my colleagues. Thanks very much, Mel. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, you know, the, the, the deepest cuts that we were fearing this year seem to have been put off perhaps until next year. Uh, the government is focusing instead on cuts to wages. Uh, but there is one big exception, and that exception is uh, the cuts that we're seeing this year uh, on top of the cuts that we've seen in the past two years to the post-secondary sector. And uh, we're joined tonight by uh, two union presidents who represent uh, literally thousands of people who work uh, in, uh, in our universities and colleges. And uh, so I'm going to turn first over to uh, Quinn Benders, who is the vice president of the Non-Academic mm -hmm. Staff Association at the University of Alberta. Arguably, the University of Alberta um, is uh, the hardest hit institution uh, in the hardest hit sector. Uh, and so because you're sort of at the pointy end of the stick, uh, Quinn, and it's your members who have been losing their jobs, um, uh, and, and this is not hypothetical, it's not something that's going to happen in, in months, it's already been happening to your members, and it's just going to get worse based on this budget. I just wanted to turn it over to you first to talk about uh, this budget from the perspective of someone representing uh, the, uh, the support staff at Alberta's biggest uh, university. So over to you, Quinn. Uh, thank, thank you, Gil, and thank you for having me tonight. Um, what I would like to say, I mean, the, the post-secondary sector has been extremely hard hit across the province. So I should start by saying that, um, that many institutions are, are, are reeling from this. Um, but speaking particularly from the University of Alberta representing support staff, um, I feel that we have been disproportionately um, um, hit by these, these, this austerity budget. Uh, just to give you some numbers to put it in perspective, um, we're gonna lose another $135 million through provincial funding to PSE this year. Um, 113 million planned for next year. And this is on top of 182 million in cuts implemented last year. Um, so this is also on top of uh, performance-based funding models that, that are gonna be coming forward. And those are going to be punitive and probably hit the university um, by um, reducing our funding based on aspects that we can't control about the economy. Um, and once again, uh, the University of Alberta has been disproportionately singled out uh, for more severe cuts than any other universities or colleges in the province, um, being absorbed to uh, get another 11% cut. And that's about another $60 million reduction in funding for this year. And that is almost the entire uh, half of the entire PSE reduction um, in this budget. Um, so combining these cuts with the new cuts announced on February 25th, the university has lost about 170 million. That's the University of Alberta has lost about 170 million in provincial funding. Um, that's almost 30% of its total campus Alberta grant. And that's just two and a half years. Um, so as you can imagine, these have been extremely devastating for, for the university and in particular for our membership. The, the university administration has been forced to implement kind of a rushed restructuring plan to deal with the cuts um, that are deeper and faster than, than any university has had to deal with that I know of. Um, and the result of this is, is that more than 1,100 of our staff will lose their jobs as the university structures and tries to balance its books. And it's trying to balance its books through this restructuring, but the, the reality is that it's being uh, balanced on the backs of our members. Um, like I said, we're, we're due to lose about 1,100 staff. I assume um, more are in the books for the future, although it's really, really hard to say. And this comes at a time when we're trying to, um, you know, support research students and teaching at the University of Alberta. And all of those are going to take an extremely hard hit going forward. Um, you know, the, the quality of learning, research, and student experience in the university uh, will decrease and we won't be able to deliver it at those at that way any longer. And at the same time, students are facing tuition hikes of 7%. 
um, and they're getting reduced financial support. So a large swath of the future of the province is being cut out of access to post-secondary education or feeling like they can access post-secondary education in the future. Um, we need the university to be a driver of the economy and we need to protect the jobs at the university now um, in order to protect the research, um, the research, the teaching and the services that, that students need at the university um, in order to make a strong economy and a strong citizenship going forward. Thanks very much, Quinn. Uh, we're also joined by one of your colleagues at the University of Alberta. Uh, his name is Ricardo Acuna and uh, he's president of the Association of Academic Staff at the University of Alberta. Uh, and as the, the title suggests, he represents uh, the academic staff. So Ricardo, uh, what, is, what is the budget from your, what, what, how does the budget look from your perspective and what does it mean uh, perhaps not only for uh, your members and the University of Alberta, but, uh, but the whole province? Thanks, Gil. Uh, I mean, there's there's the, the really short and easy answer here is that this budget is devastating. It really, uh, I think, across the province will damage and hurt the ability of universities and colleges of the whole sector to actually meet our public interest mandate in service of Albertans. Um, across the province right now, uh, with this budget, we're nearing almost $500 million in cuts since this government took office in 2019. That's about, that's pushing 20% of the funding that the provincial government used to provide for operations and post-secondary, 20% will have been cut uh, by the time this budget comes into play. Um, as Quinn pointed out at the University of Alberta, that's even steeper, right? And right now, uh, since this government took office, we've faced cuts of about 25 to 30% already with more coming next year. We know this. Um, so yeah, it is uh, damaging at a time when the universities have had to pivot to uh, teach online, to move course instruction online, which has required more work from uh, professors and advisors and support staff, the university is actually having to cut those same staff. At the time when they're cutting, supports for students, supports for teaching and research on campus, they're raising tuition by 7% a year, which is unsustainable. Um, we've lost since last year, 200 instructors on campus. So we're doing more work, teaching more students with 200 fewer instructors. And when we talk about these numbers, the, the 1,100 that Quinn mentioned that are losing their jobs, these are only the full time staff with contracts. Those folks on short term contracts, those precarious folks, who are being let go, who are just simply aren't being renewed year after year, those are hundreds more people that we're losing on campus. The bottom line is this, the Premier talks a very good game about this budget being about jobs. Clearly our jobs don't matter uh, or don't count as jobs in his book. And he talks about economic recovery. And the bottom line is that we can't recover from the mess we've got right now without the type of research innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship that comes from a well-funded post-secondary system. And this government is doing everything in its power to destroy that system. I talk to my members, professors and instructors who are thinking of leaving the province. I talk to students who are wanting to leave the province to go to schools everywhere else. This is unsustainable going forward. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, as, just as in a personal aside, Ricardo and I, went to the University of Alberta as students together many, many years ago. And, um, and now uh, I think we're both at the, the point where we have kids who are getting to the age where they will be starting university. And as a U of A uh, alumnus, uh, as someone who has been leading the labor movement in this province for years, I'm just heart sick uh, what the UCP is doing to our uh, post-secondary sector. They're, they're ripping the heart out of institutions uh, that are at the center of our economy and turning world-class institutions into something much less. And uh, we're all gonna pay the price, price for that. So uh, th thanks Ricardo, thanks Quinn. Uh, we're gonna turn our attention now to the other big sector that uh, people are talking about. In fact, just today, 
Uh, Jason Kenney and his health minister, Tyler Shandro, uh, certainly not the most popular politician in this province, uh, they had a press conference to claim uh, that uh, the budget shows that uh, the, the UCP's continued support for the healthcare sector. Uh, <laughs> the talk about uh, whether or not that's true, and I'm, I'm guessing that she's going to say that it's not true. Uh, we're joined tonight by Heather Smith, who's the president of the United Nurses of Alberta, representing about 30,000 registered nurses and registered psychiatric nurses. Uh, Heather, what's your take on the budget? And uh, maybe what's your take on what Jason Kenney and uh, Tyler Shandro said about their support for healthcare today? Oh, I missed that announcement. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they were convincing anyone. I don't think so. Well, I mean, the immediate reaction to the budget is, is going back to the healthcare guarantee, right? Uh, promise to spend at least what was uh, being spent, if not more, on healthcare, a way of assuring the public pre-election that uh, they weren't going to decimate uh, healthcare. So people believed, you know, that there would be no job loss of frontline workers. I, in fact, uh, what this budget has is a 5%, uh, 5.2% reduction to Alberta Health Services. Um, we have continued to have the uh, plan of uh, contracting out uh, some 11,000 jobs, eliminating some 750 registered nurses jobs, um, and continuing to look at private delivery of services in terms of private clinics. I, I just point out, um, if Albertans don't understand, when you contract out, you don't save money. And in fact, they're not, I don't think they're suggesting to save money in terms of contracting out because you still have, you pay in fact, what the difference you have is if you pay a dollar because of the need for the contracted uh, provider to make a profit of at least 10 to 15%, it means that for every dollar that you're actually spending for the delivery uh, for paying for public services, you're getting 85 to 90 cents on the dollar. And, um, you know, this is uh, contracting out uh, maybe a, a smoke and mirrors games in terms of making it look like it's not a government uh, responsibility, but as taxpayers, it's still our responsibility. The difference is what it means to the workers. It means that they generally end up with lower incomes, lower benefits, and of course, quite often the reduction or total removal of income security uh, in, in terms of that. And that doesn't just affect the workers immediate, it affects their families, it affects the economy, as you mentioned, Gil. But uh, interestingly enough, um, in this budget, in addition to saying that they're cutting some $441 million or four hundred uh, yeah, $441 million, just after announcing that, oh, we're going to be giving 465 million to critical uh, workers, not just in, in healthcare, but across the, the system and systems in terms of COVID. 75% um, of that was federal, federal dollars. So it's that many. But if you look at what's happened here is they're also talking about in the budget of increasing healthcare providers by some 2,940, which is an interesting number to me because they didn't say approximately uh, 3,000, they didn't say approximately even 2,900, 2,940. The way they're going to do that is by reducing the compensation of the workers that remain in the system to fund um, actually trying to improve staffing levels and staffing levels across the healthcare continuum have been an issue. They were a huge issue pre-COVID. They've been an issue all through COVID. So the, this budget suggesting there's going to be more healthcare workers, but there's only going to be more healthcare workers on the backs of the workers in the system. So from my perspective, what we call this is a tax in terms of healthcare on healthcare workers to provide other healthcare workers in the system. So. Um, I, I just, again, that guarantee of, uh, to Albertans, I think was uh, absolutely false and this budget just proves it. And in terms of contracting out uh, jobs and you know lab and all these other support jobs, that is dismantling the integrity of our healthcare teams because healthcare teams aren't just about doctors and nurses, the people who prepare meals and uh, do the, the cleaning, the environmental services are as much a part of our team as anyone else. And in the midst of this 
COVID as continues to suggest that the dismantling and the chaos that will come uh, from the contracting out will not have a significant and serious impact on healthcare and healthcare services. And I suspect mm -hmm. a huge loss of personnel uh, who will abandon the professions, uh, look for other jurisdictions to work in. Um, it's very much going back to you know, the Klein years and the huge deficits that resulted from the Klein actions that took almost 15, 20 years to try to dig our way out of that hole. So this is not a healthcare friendly budget. It's not a friendly budget for taxpayers. And it is, you know, getting less is the, is the bottom line, getting less, uh, whether you're a worker or whether you're a taxpayer. Thanks very much, Heather. Um, our next uh, guest is Guy Smith. He's the president of Alberta's largest union, uh, representing, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 workers in many sectors of the economy. Uh, Guy has members uh, in healthcare, but, uh, but he also has members in just about every corner of the public service and communities around the province. Guy, um, we've, we've heard from uh, Quinn and uh, Ricardo about post-secondary, where you have some members, quite a few actually. Uh, we've heard from Heather, uh, about what's happening in healthcare and what this budget means to those workers. Uh, tell us what this means to the many, many other workers in other sectors of the public service uh, that you, you represent. Thank, thanks, Gil, and, and thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, you know, I'm kind of envious of all these other uh, labor representatives because they can focus on one part of the budget. We have to look at everything from beginning to end because you're right, we represent workers in healthcare, post secondary, primary education, boards and agencies, municipalities, and of course, direct government services. And really, what this budget shows, it's uh, the continued attacks on workers since this government uh, got elected. And it's a continued attack on uh, jobs and services that, uh, that Albertans rely upon. And we got to remember that this is a choice. A budget is a choice. It's, uh, it's a decision made based on what you believe in. And this government obviously believes in throwing workers out of their jobs and onto the streets devastating communities um, through, take, through wage rollbacks and taking uh, billions of dollars out of the economy that can sustain the economy when it needs it the most and showing absolute disrespect to those workers on the front lines, regardless of what service they provide, who have seen us for the past year struggling through this pandemic and there to support Albertans and this is what they get as a thank you. And quite honestly, uh, Heather ref, ref, um, referred to the, uh, the critical worker benefit. Well, I can tell you, no government worker received that critical worker benefit. The, J Jason Kenney's own employees weren't respected enough by their boss to even get that little bit of recognition. And what we're seeing also is rollbacks and cuts at the bargaining table. So it's not a surprise what we saw last Thursday, and it's a choice. This is a choice this government has made because of their ideology and their philosophy. Well, you know what? We choose not to accept that. We choose instead to stand up and fight for jobs, real jobs, Jason Kenney. The ones you're trying to eliminate, we'll stand up and fight for those and we'll fight for services to the people of this province. That's what we will choose to do. And, and I, I, I really encourage anyone that's, that's watching this, that's connected in their community, we have to choose to fight back. Otherwise, this province is not going to look like um, the province that we entered into even a couple of years ago. So that's what we have to do. We have to choose to fight back and stand strong. And if it's not now, you're right, uh, Gil, when you say next year is going to be even worse. If we aren't able to fight back and, and win some battles now, um, and, and next year is even worse, then what everyone's been saying about people, uh, you know, pulling up their sticks and leaving Alberta, uh, this 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 province is going to be absolutely decimated. So they choose to attack us. They choose to take on workers. They choose to um, eliminate services to the people of this province. We choose to stand up and fight for jobs and services. Thanks. Thanks very much, Guy. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, there are a lot of people on the, the call today uh, who share your 
passion for standing up and pushing back. Uh, and there's some qu questions are coming out already. What are we going to do about it? <laughs> but before we get there, I just want to give uh, our last panel member an opportunity to talk about uh, his members. Uh, and once again, uh, our, our final guest tonight is Roy Gill. He's the uh, president of the Alberta Division of the Canadian Union of uh, Public Employees. And uh, he represents thousands of people working in school boards, in municipalities. Uh, and uh, so, you know, for his perspective, I'm just going to throw it over to you, Rory. Uh, what do you think of this budget? What does it mean to your members? What does it mean to the province? And then once, once we've had that conversation, we're going to come back to the, the, the obvious next question, which Guy has already uh, opened the door to, which is what are we going to do about it? So, uh, Rory? Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Gil. And um, it's great to be it's great to be here tonight and uh, be able to talk to all of you. And Guy said that, uh, you know, he envied some folks who had, um, you know, um, single, single occupations and things like that. I, I, I kind of envy the folks who got to go ahead of me because uh, there's not much else uh, criticisms I can throw at uh, Jason Kenny at this point. But I will say that what Jason Kenny, the only thing that he's good at is making things worse. And this, that's what this budget does. And, you know, I think that's why Jason Kenny's such an icon on the right, because they fetishize failure and, and you'll never find a record of, you know, hate, ruin and adject failure like Jason Kenny has brought in his, during his political career. And he's done that here in an incredibly, dis an incredibly dishonest and destructive budget. And, you know, you've, you'll, you'll have seen in, in the media that some people are saying, oh, it's a stand pat budget. And, and Kenny's talked about, you know, the unprecedented um investments that they've made but it, it is completely nonsense what they're talking about and you know uh qb members work in um in uh, health uh, long-term care social services uh, municipalities and education but education is a place you can really look at this dishonesty because you know they the, the ucp inherited a public education system that you know is recognized throughout the world as, as being of high quality and and our members work there as educational assistants uh, edu uh custodial uh, support um trades people administrative support library support and they really make sure that you know they really have dedicated themselves to making sure that alberta's got an education system that we can all be proud of and and kenny has done everything he can and his uh, education minister, Adrian Lagrange, is his willing hench person to destroy our education system. And, and some of you will remember at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, at the beginning of this, of this terrible crisis that we're still mired in, um, Kenny and his uh, education minister, Lagrange, made the decision to lay off 20,000 people in education and uh, devastate the system. And, and yes, kids were home, but they needed that support. They needed the help with that transition to uh, online learning at the time. And, and they couldn't have cared less. I, I can tell you that I had a conversation the day before those layoffs happened with someone in the education department assuring me that we were gonna work together. And they just basically spit in our face and spit in the face of thousands of people who dedicated their, their lives to making sure that education is strong in this province. And, and this budget is continuing that disrespect because it's hidden, you know, in, in different grants and things like that and different funding streams. But there is a major cut to education and it is going to keep 1800 people out of work, people who weren't brought back, you know, after the layoffs, after the summertime. And we know that there's 20,000 more kids coming into the system and there are going to be less resources and less people working there. And this is a government that says they care about Albertans and, and, you know, they're constantly talking about future generations. Well, what about this generation? What about the generations that's dealing with a, an economic crisis that we've never seen before and a health crisis that we, none of us could have imagined? This generation doesn't seem to matter because it's always somebody else. Kenny's good at making things worse and he's incredibly good at blaming somebody else, which is what they do with education. So we've got the, you know, they'll say that they have the, uh, the, um, the, the uh, funding going to the uh, school boards and it's the school board's fault because they can't uh, spend it right. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, it is just a case of a government not caring about, not caring about kids, not caring about Albertans and only caring about uh, their pals in uh, the corporate world. And, 
you know, the other, like I said, we, we've got folks right across the public sector. Another place we, we have many, many members is municipalities. And municipalities are going to suffer a $750 million cut over the life of just this budget. Um, and if you think about it, municipalities uh, deliver the bulk of visible public services, those public services we can, we can see and touch, recreation centers, uh, the roads we drive on, um, the parks we the parks we spend our time in, and they are going to be starved by this. And you know, I'll point out, you know, and, and we've talked about this. You know, Jason Kenney, uh, you know, during the pandemic, decided that he was going to bet uh, at least a billion and a half directly of our tax dollars, billions more in loan guarantees uh, on the Keystone XL pipeline. You know, in in a desperate attempt, you know, to to, to, to bolster the resource sector, which you know. We're not against the resource sector in the union movement, but we realize there's a transition that needs to happen. So Kenny bet billions of our dollars, essentially on on, uh, on Donald Trump being reelected president. You know, uh, something that you know just makes me want to vomit, and 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 duped people in Alberta. And that money, that direct money, that billion and a half, could have taken care of the uh, operating deficit in Calgary, Edmonton, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, other municipalities, and and kept people working. His guy and and, and Ricardo and Heather have talked about actual jobs, people working right now. They could have done that and they haven't done that. And um, this is why we need to stand up and fight back. And Gil said, there's people in the, the chat and I noticed early on somebody asked, okay, we, we know we're in a terrible situation. What can we do? We need to keep this resistance up. And it, it seems very difficult right now because we, we can't be on the streets like, like we wanna be and we can't have those meetings face to face, but we can, we, we're doing it right now. And we can also get a hold of, of, our, of our elected representatives, especially UCP MLAs. And let me tell you, they are scared shitless right now. They think they are going to lose their jobs. And that's a group of people I want to put out of work. But if you keep that pressure up on them and let them know that we don't support these policies, that we don't support suicidal uh, cuts you know, in, in this economic crisis, they will put pressure on them. And like I say, we can fight back and the time will come when we can be on the streets, like Guy said, and we can stand up, fight back, let them know what's going on and, and ultimately be rid of this gang of clowns. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, thanks, uh, Rory. And that, that's a good segue to the, the last part of the conversation I think we're gonna have tonight. And that's the question of uh, what next, what are we gonna do? And uh, in response to those questions that are being asked tonight, and uh, honestly, a lot of our members and the broader public have been asking them for months now, um, you know, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. The first is that uh, when it comes to the strength of ordinary people, uh, when it comes to the strength of workers, and when it comes to the strength of uh, unions, our real strength is not in our, you know, the buildings that we might own or our bank accounts, uh, or even in the leaders that, that, that are in front of you today, our real strength is in our members and uh, who, you know, who come together and act collectively. And that's, that's our superpower is bringing people together and, uh, in, and encouraging them uh, to, uh, to, to work together. And you know, with, with, you know, I was reminded of that this morning, you know, how on Facebook you open your Facebook and then there's, there's a memory, you know? Uh, Many, many of you will remember what happened on this day seven years ago. It was, uh, you know, <laughs> it was the day that we had uh, a big rally to protect our public sector pension plans. It was minus 30. We got 30,000 people out. Uh, we got 5,000 people out in minus 30 uh, to protect public sector pensions. It was part of a, a big camp, province-wide campaign organized by many of the unions that are represented on this call today. We mobilized more than 100,000 people to uh, make calls to MLAs, to knock on their doors, to uh, uh, you know, uh, scare the living crap out of them. And uh, they withdrew that pension legislation, uh, Bill, Bill 9 and Bill 10, uh, because of the, the action that we organized. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we're gonna have to do again, as Rory said, that's difficult in the current situation with uh, COVID restrictions. Um, you know, but what I wanna say is that we're getting ready for that kind of action uh, and perhaps action on even a larger scale right now. Um, you know, and, and I, I really do hope that someone from the UCP is watching this webinar because what I want you, if you're a UCP uh, a member or you're reporting back to Jason Kenny, I, I want you to go back to Jason and, uh, and tell him that 
all the union leaders and their members are talking. Uh, and this is not the only time we get together. We get together on a regular basis. We talk to each other, we're planning. Uh, so AUPE is talking to uh, QP, QP is talking to UNA, UNA is talking to HSA and uh, the unions representing people at the universities. Um, but we're not just talking, we're planning. And so when this, uh, when this crisis, the COVID crisis passes, uh, we, will, we'll, we will be ready to do what needs to be done and that's stand up, push back and fight back. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, anyone else from the panel who wants to talk about next steps and uh, what we think that uh, needs to be done uh, in order to um, you know, not only protect our members' jobs, but, the, but more importantly, the services that they provide and that are so necessary uh, for, to this province at all times, but especially, you know, if we're going to recover from this, uh, you know, COVID crisis and the recession, uh, we need public services, quality public services more than ever. Um, and not only maintaining what we've got, we've got to think bigger. Um, things like, you know, investments in infrastructure, invest, investments in childcare, um, you know, the, 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 the challenge that we face transforming our province in the post-COVID world can only be met by collective action. That means that we need governments that think big, not that, not and and, and, and want to build things, not tear them down. So, um, you know, uh, maybe on that on that note, I'm going to throw it to others. Anyone else want to talk about uh, what needs to be done? Um, and then uh, perhaps after we've gone one round, we're going to have to wrap it up because we are getting sort of close to the end here. Who would like to jump in? Guy has his hand up. Guy, go ahead. Uh, th thanks, Gil. Uh, I don't think we can wait till after the pandemic is, is done. I mean, uh, most of us are at the negotiating table facing massive cuts, um, massive layoffs and, and uh, you know, concessions everywhere. And uh, I know for the health, our healthcare contracts, like other healthcare uh, unions, that's been put on hold. But the governor of Alberta has been negotiating with its own employees. In fact, we got two more days this week where we're negotiating directly with the government of Alberta. That's going to come to a head very soon. And what we've been doing with our members is reaching out. Yes, it's been very difficult during COVID, but making those one-to-one -one calls, uh, making sure that we've got the infrastructure in place to prepare our members for strike. And you're right. A lot of this may not, you know, in many areas may not happen till after the pan pandemic is thankfully over, but the pre preparation work takes months, if not years. And anybody listening uh, and watching at the moment who's interested in building uh, mass resistance to this, this government, you cannot wait. You have to start that now. Whatever group you're, you're connected to, uh, whatever community you're in, make those connections now. Have those discussions about how we all need to stand up and take to the streets if necessary because the future really depends on it. So I just wanted to remind everyone that there could be picket lines long before this pandemic is over. Now, what that looks like during a pandemic, I don't know. But if you see a picket line, if you see workers fighting for jobs and fighting for services to Albertans, stand with them, be with them, do whatever you can to support them, because that will be the front edge of the red wedge of the resistance against this government is worker power. And then behind that, obviously, the power of the citizens of, of the province. So be prepared for that. It could come a lot sooner than you actually think. Thanks. Gil, Thanks, I can. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Ricardo. Yeah. yeah, I just want to follow up on that because, I mean, Guy's right on the money that, that we've got a lot of work to do internally with our members to get them ready and mobilize them and energize them. Um, th that work is in progress as far as, as post-secondary is concerned. And I've got to tell you, the employers and the government are doing a great job of motivating and mobilizing our members for us. Uh, but there's another side to that equation too, at least in post-secondary, um, is that uh, we've got to have a conversation with Albertans. The, since starting since Ralph Klein, uh, premiers of this province has succeeded in instilling a strong anti-intellectual bias among Albertans. The reason this government is cutting post-secondary to the degree they don't dare cut anything else right now is because they think they can. They think that their myth telling about university employees is a bunch of elitists sitting around smoking pipes and laughing at philosopher jokes, um, that that'll let them get away with it. And we need to have a conversation with Albertans about the benefits that we provide 
about the fact that most of the teaching on our campuses is done by precarious staff members, about the fact that the people who are bearing the brunt of these cuts are not the presidents and the VPs of our universities, but rather the frontline maintenance and facilities and librarian supports and all of those folks on the front lines that aren't making the big paychecks. We have those conversations externally. We do the work internally. And yeah, hopefully we can get to a point where we can actually mobilize and make some change. Good, thanks Ricardo. Any others would like to jump in on the question of uh, what we do, what next? Rory and then Heather. Yeah, thanks Gillen. Um, many of these discussions and you know we talk about this you know and, and yeah i mean there there there's a huge movement right now within the labor movement within our unions right to, 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 you know to activate people and and you know and, and and get to a deep organizing and and really begin but it takes a long time but the other thing i would say you know there, there's literally hundreds of people here tonight don't be afraid to be radical and 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 this is something i'm pushing myself to do as well but you know, we really, you know, it's 365 days since the lockdown began next next week from what, you know, from what I can remember, I think that's right. And it's, it's, it's you know, an un, you know, unprecedented crisis. We keep saying that over and over again, but how many unprecedented crises do we remember in the last 20 years and, and how much change have we seen? And, you know, I'm part of this, I'm, I'm a labor leader, but so, yeah, I, I would encourage people, you know, to really think, you know, what kind of society we want to do and, and, want to have and, and how do we come out of this and you know one of the things you know that that, um, that uh, we heard right off the top was that Kenny said well I, you know once we're through this this little bump in the road we're going to cut seven or eight billion dollars and the insanity of that and, and we barely got through this right with what we had in this province and, and for him to you know to, to stand up and publicly say that he's going to cut more you know, we're being led by insane people Right. And, and we need to radically change the system. So I, I would say that, yeah, just the next step should be let's have these conversations. Let, let's think about a society we can really, really want to be part of. And, you know, we're part of that. The labor movement, push us, push everything. But let's let's come out of this and get some real change. OK, thanks, Rory. Heather? Yeah, just quickly, um, Rory, it will be one year on March 11th since uh, the World Health Organization declared a COVID-19 a, a pandemic. Uh, so yes, it is a year uh, next week. And I just wanna add to the, as we've been talking tonight, I've written down two, two words. Uh, one is accountability and the other is transparency. And we may not be able to gather in numbers uh, in, you know, in our cities or uh, on wherever in terms of visually uh, making our presence known, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't and we couldn't and we must um, hold our MLAs accountable. And, you know, that's, there's lots of ways of doing that. Get, us, get them on your speed dial texting, um, you know, there's lots of vehicles in terms of the uh, Stop Kenny campaign, the, the stuff on the AFL website, but it's, it's really important that we don't allow them to take our public money and spend it in private delivery without transparency and accountability, regardless of whether it's education or health or anything. And that's a big problem we've had in healthcare, of course, is that private, um, Con contracts with private providers, whether that's long-term care or elsewhere, is are not disclosed to the public. There is no transparency. And so accountability, transparency, and don't wait till we can gather. It's got to be now and it's got to be consistent and repeat, repeat, repeat that this agenda is not in the public interest and we do not support it. Thanks very much, Heather. Uh, and any other uh, final words from members of the panel before we wrap up? We're uh, a little bit past eight o'clock now. Bill, can I put in yeah, a go word ahead, there? Bill. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, I would just like to say that there's a tremendous amount of misinformation out there and the government just dishes this out by the shovel hole. And of course it gets repeated and repeated and repeated. And as mentioned already, the, the the, the, the it's really a choice, but it's a choice that Albertans are going to have to make. So, you know, we've only seen, we've probably seen less than half of the plans for the cuts that are, are coming. 
And it will probably take time for Albertans to fully recognize what, what the implications of this are. I mean, I think we're going down the path of what I call the unsustainable climb cuts. You know, they went down, but they didn't last. And uh, I think that uh, the public sector uh, workers, but not only public sector workers, but you know, people that are, are informed need to make clear to the public what are the consequences of the cuts that we've already suffered? What are the consequences or what will the consequences be of those who uh, of those cuts that are coming be, uh, in addition? Because they're going to be big. You know, eight billion, yes, probably so. Okay, thanks, Mel. Well, we're almost out of time. So I'm just gonna say a couple of words in conclusion. And um, it seems to me that uh, we, we've got battles on many fronts, but I'm just gonna wrap up by with comments on two notions. The first has to do with narratives. Um, you know, we've heard tonight that uh, in many ways, uh, we're in the midst of a battle of political narratives. Uh, Jason Kenney and the UCP uh, are, spinning stories about uh, public services and public spending, which are not true. They're spinning stories um, and, uh, and myths about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, about public sector workers <laughs> uh, trying to demonize us uh, and uh, suggest that uh, we're drags on the economy as opposed to, uh, you know, providing important foundations for the economy. Uh, so one of the things that we have to do very clearly is to challenge those conservative narratives, um, the ones about public sector workers, public services, uh, even this narrative that there is no alternative and that uh, cuts are inevitable. Uh, we know that that's not the true because uh, we have a broken revenue system and that if we were fixed, uh, we'd be in a much better position. So um, that's one of the first things that we have been doing. And one of the things that we need to continue doing is challenging those narratives that uh, Jason Kenney and the UCP are using to justify uh, you know the, the you know these very destructive attacks on uh, on our institutions and our provinces. Uh, the final thing that I think that we really have to talk about and uh, repeat over and over again uh, has to do with collective action. Um, what we're facing right now is a collective action problem. Uh, the vast majority of Albertans believe in education. They believe in healthcare. They believe in the importance of the public sector to provide a foundation for our economy to provide services for families and the communities. Um, but uh, we have to remind people that, uh, that, that they have power and, uh, but that power can only be realized and it can only be wielded uh, when we do it intentionally and we make the decisions to come together. Um, we as a labor movement are, you know, uh, union leaders here. I mean, and in in the, in the unions that we represent, we're in a unique position uh, because we have institutions uh, that can bring people together. That's why they're scared of us, okay? That's why the UCP has passed things like Bill 32 to weaken the power of the unions because they know something that sometimes we forget ourselves is that, uh, you know, we have power when we act collectively and, and, they, and they know that if we get our acts together, um, we can push back uh, and limit the damage over the next two years and make sure that this is just a one-term government. Uh, so, but uh, as Guy said, we can't wait until the next election. We have to fight now. Um, you're going to, you're probably going to start seeing that fight, um, through legal strike action, uh, over the next, uh, six months or well, next three months, three to six months. Uh, but that's just going to be a catalyst. We're going to need citizens to join us. Um, so, so, you know, we know we have a big responsibility where as a labor movement, we're willing to step up and embrace that responsibility. Uh, to, to defend our members, to defend the services they provide, to defend our vision of a province uh, that is very different than the vision being presented by the UCP. But, you know, we can do it together. So, um, you know, tonight I just want to thank uh, first uh, all the panelists who have joined us for this very important discussion. Um, we're going to have continue to have conversations like that, like this with each other. Uh, and um, and it, you, we're going to be inviting more people to join us in those com conversations in events like this webinar. Uh, so please look for those opportunities uh, and join us when you can. So thank you to the panelists. Thanks to, uh, to Mel and Heather and uh, Guy and Ricardo and Quinn and Rory. 
Um, I also want to give a shout out to uh, two of our staff members at the Federation of Labour, uh, Ramona uh, Franson and Tony Clark. They were instrumental in pulling this uh, webinar together. You don't see them, but they're actually with us right now. Uh, and I want to thank them for their help and support. But most importantly, I want to thank all of you um, who've joined us um, uh, on Zoom or through the Facebook Live connection. Um, as I said, I mean, uh, you know, we, we have a big uphill battle in front of us. Uh, but I'm confident based on uh, what we've been able to accomplish together before uh, that we can push back, we can stand up to Kenny, we can push back as, against his agenda, uh, we can put the fear of God into those UCP backbenchers uh, and make them hesitate about implementing, uh, proceeding with this agenda that is uh, so destructive and potentially unpopular, but we, can, we, need, we need to do it together. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, if you're looking for something uh, to do to connect, to, to make sure that we're, we're part of the solution, um, I, I encourage you to uh, visit uh, the AFL's uh, campaign website, www.standuptokenny.ca. If, if you haven't already done that, please visit the site. It's uh, www.standuptokenny.ca uh, and uh, you know, sign up for the campaign. We are creating uh, what we call community action teams in every constituency in this province. Uh, and we're going to be getting up to some good trouble uh, in, the, in, the, in the very near future. Um, so, you know, join the campaign. We'll tell you about what's happening in terms of public sector bargaining, strikes, perhaps lockouts, we don't know. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we're going to, you know, do our part uh, as part of civil society uh, to push back against Jason Kenney and his agenda and uh, protect this province that, that, that we all know and love. So, Thanks very much for joining us tonight. Thanks for the great conversation. Um, but I wanna especially thank you for all the, all the work that you're gonna do <laughs> over the next few months and the next couple of years uh, to pr uh, pr protect our province. So thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us and have a good night. Stay safe.